taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who find refuge in God. What shall we render to the Lord for all the Lord's bounty to us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. Now if you would remain standing and turn to him number 87. Ferris Lord Jesus number 87. And the scripture says, Your eyes will see the king in his beauty.
come time for our offering this morning, so if our usher can come forward.
school year that they would have a positive experience in school. Lord, I pray that you would help them to be that positive example at school. And Father, that you would be with them, guide them, and direct them. In Jesus' precious name, amen. All right. Just smile away this morning. Just smile away. <coughs> it's hard not to be happy when you see a smile. Here you go, young man. about this scripture after studying it and reading it and 
I got to thinking, have you ever experienced a time in your life where you felt like you just couldn't go on? You have had all that you could take. You've reached the end of your rope and there just isn't an ounce of thought that was left in your body. You know, I know that there have been many times in my life where I felt this way. And this feeling can come because of many different things in this life. It may come because of the loss of a loved one. It may come when you're on the brink of divorce with your spouse. Or it may come when you're going through tough times at work with your boss and with your co-workers. And, and you know, life is tough. The list goes on and on of the things that can cause these issues. These things that can cause us to grow weary very quickly. <coughs> and our scripture this morning, I think, shows us this. So as you will, if you will, please turn with me to 1 Kings, again, the 19th chapter. And we're going to read from the 4th verse through the 8th verse. Hear the word of God. <clears throat> While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush, and he fell asleep. <clears throat> All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate, and he drank, and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up, and he ate, and he drank. And strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, our text this morning comes between Elijah's triumph on Mount Carmel and that still small voice inside. And if you read the NIV's uh, word, it actually says the quiet whisper to the still small voice. It was the low point in Elijah's career as a prophet. You know, Elijah had just experienced a dramatic climax to his ministry in his confrontation with the worshipers of Baal on Mount Carmel. The spectacular revelation of God and, and the fire on Mount Carmel would remain the most sensational triumph of, of Elijah's career. You know, in our view, he walked away from Mount Carmel, what I would consider a hero. But if you read chapter 19, it doesn't seem like he was very heroic. Jezebel would not give up so easily. She vowed to kill this troubled prophet of God. And Elijah feared for his life, so he ran. And here we see Elijah as a very ordinary human being. The hero of Mount Carmel quickly became the weary loner, crying, I've had enough. What happened to Elijah? He was afraid. He was defeated. He was burned out and he was ready to give up. He was at a point where men of God and people of God often find themselves. You ever been there? You know, Elijah had his glorious moment up on Mount Carmel. It was God's glorious moment, of course, and, and maybe even Elijah had to learn this truth more clearly. The prophets of Baal were defeated. God had provided a double miracle. The all-consuming fire from heaven and the rain that ended the drought. And both had come because of Elijah and his prayer. You know, it may even be that he assumed that his time under the cross was at an end. People committed to God are not always immune to being human, are they? Whether positive or whether negative emotions are part of humanity, our emotions are plugged into the biological and chemical parts of our bodies. And so often these are very uncontrollable things. You know, feeling good and being happy are not always good measures of our commitment to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus. Likewise, feeling depressed, feeling discouraged, feeling anxious, feeling doubtful, feeling like I have had enough are not necessarily signs of spiritual relapse either. You know, all of Elijah's dreams seem to collapse around him. The man of courage found himself afraid and running, and, and the victorious prophet thought that his cause was lost for good. You know, God's enemies 
They seemed to be in charge, and Elijah felt like he was the only one that was left. You know, we all have similar feelings in our lives, don't we? Peer pressure works on the young and on the old. The pressure of the job or of being without a job. The mockery of being a Christian or acting in ways that fit the Christian life. The condescension, the accusations of narrow-mindedness that come from unbelievers. You know, all these things take their toll on us. But you know, there's something that is worse that faces the shepherd and his flock. And it's the realization that we don't serve the Lord Jesus the way that he should and he deserves to be served. From this knowledge comes a guilt, a guilt which can paralyze and lead us to despair. You know, guilt, guilt which works against faith, against hope, against love. This morning our text in verse 4 says, He himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree. He sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. In other words, Elijah basically says, I give up, Lord. It's too much for me. I can't go on like this. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Have you ever felt this way? I know you have. And you know what? So do I. I've felt this way more, more than I'm probably willing to admit. You see, in Elijah, we see a man. James, the brother of Jesus, said Elijah was a man. said he was a human, just like you. And just like me, he was weak within himself to accomplish what God had called him to do. Every fiber of his being had given up, and he wanted to die. The straw had finally broken the camel's back. To him, it seemed that there was no reason for him to go on. His recognition that he was no better than his ancestors prompted him to pray and to make a confession to God. You see, his confession to God was, I give up, Lord. I give up. What, what led him to this confession is not very clear. Was it the result of the fear that he felt because of the threat that was on his life? Was it because of the fear that he had ran and, and he had failed to oppose godlessness by standing up for the covenant of his Lord and his Savior? Was it an overwhelming sense of, of sin or inadequacy? You know, whatever, whatever it was, it was well said by him. It is also in the tradition of other men of God who did not assume a Pharisaic role in opposition to their people, but confessed their sins along with those of their people. It is a humble admission like that of the publican and like Paul when they said, I am the, I am the least of the apostles. I do not even deserve to be called an apostle. But you know, the reality of his sin was not a reason for him to give up. It is precisely that when, when we realize our failures and, and our inadequacies, that's, that's when we receive God's power. That's when we receive the strength from our Lord and our Savior. You see, in his weakness, Elijah saw the power and the providence of God, his Savior, and then we read on in our text in verses 5 and 7, 5 through 7. It says, Then he lay down under the tree, and he fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and he drank, and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat. But the journey is too much for you. You know, as God provided food for Elijah in the home of the widow, he was doing it once again right here. Neither the failure of Elijah's expectations, nor his fear, nor any of his sins had placed him outside of the sphere of God's love. Neither did it nullify or change his call as a prophet. You see, God does not give up on us nearly as easy as we give up on him. God came to Elijah in the desert in the midst of his despair. And while Elijah may have had enough of God, God had not yet had his fill of Elijah. 
In fact, God acted in a remarkable way. A holy messenger, an angel of vast power came to him, but came to him in a ministering spirit. You know, such messengers are and were at God's disposal. Yet God had chosen to bring his word to the world through creatures like you and like me, who are limited in power, who are prone to messing up, who are prone to error, and who are frequently defeated. And I think that the, Paul, the Apostle Paul understood this when he wrote these words. So to keep me from being too elated by the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me. To keep me from being too elated, three times I, play, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. I love that verse. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. You know, the old proverb we read and we say a lot of times, God helps those who help themselves. A lot of people will even maintain that it says so in the Bible. But the truth is that God helps those who cannot help themselves. And he lets them see that help only after he lets them know in no uncertain way that they cannot help themselves. Yes, even when we don't see the help, it is there. Even the fear, the frustration, the failure that we face in our services to God are used by him for our blessing. They confront us so that we may be drawn closer to God's grace. And so that in his grace it may work in us and through us more effectively. You see, our hope and our help may not be as spectacular as it was for Elijah in his case. But nonetheless, it is still real. It is still very powerful and very real. And so God helped Elijah. And then our text continued in verse 8. And it says he got up and he ate and he drank and it strengthened him by that food. And he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. You see, the food which Elijah had received was certainly strengthening. It gave Elijah a supernatural degree of strength, and it lasted him for 40 days. And you know, this, under, this underlines the truth that God was providing for his prophet. Elijah had thought that he was alone and that he was a defeated and, and, he, and no, God had no longer any use for him. But God was with him. God was giving him strength. He was guiding him. And God still had a use for him and for his life. You know, Elijah's journey took him to Mount Horeb. And this mountain is the mountain of God. That mountain was also associated with Moses. God's great manifestation to him and the covenant that was given to his people. Elijah was sent to this mountain to commune with God. Even the time of the journey suggested the time that Moses spent on that mountain. And you know, all this points to the importance of spending time in God's work. It points to the importance of spending time in prayer with our Lord and our Savior. As I prepared this message this week, I read several commentaries and several different things online, and, and I read something that said Martin Luther King is a puzzle to the modern psychologist because he could have severe bouts of depression, and yet he would produce extraordinary amounts of work. You know, Martin Luther King, I read on, and it told me that he spent three hours a day in prayer. And if he was asked, he would tell you that the three hours a day in prayer for the best three hours of the day. So God called Elijah, and he called him to rest with God. You know, this text should be great comfort to you and to me, to every one of us, because we, we are able to remind ourselves, first of all, that the people in the Bible were real people, right? And Elijah was a real guy, just like you and me. His experience is both good and both bad. 
are not so different than yours. Not so different than mine. And you know, the same God who granted him grace and elicited service from him, he grants us the same grace and the same, he elicits the same service from us as well. We are reminded of our failures, whether they come from expectations, whether they come from fear, whether they come from sin or frustration or even our self-righteous pride. You know, they, they don't disqualify nor excuse us from service to our God. They serve a good purpose in reminding us of our sin and our utter dependence upon God and upon the Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, God is not the kind of God who beats someone into submission. He doesn't coerce our response to Him and, and He doesn't force your loyalty. That is your decision. It's my decision. But He will work to bring us to a position where we can respond to Him. Sometimes He may work in unusual or unexpected ways. Sometimes He may work through a very ordinary people or maybe even in everyday circumstances. But He will work and He will call us to a response to Him. Finally, today, we are not to look to our internal resources. For our help when we're on the bottom of this life when we're dragging the bottom we're to confess our sins and as we do God's law will reveal more of our sins to us and we find that our sources of strength are very similar to the sources that Elijah had there's an old saying that I read and, and I've heard it before and it says when God lets us stumble he does so so that we will fall into his arms When he lets us fail as his servants, he does so that we might not lose uh, that we might lose faith in ourselves and our own strength, and that we might trust in his. You know, relying on ourselves, self-reliance never offers us a real good meal. And eventually it can get us killed spiritually. The first bite of it that we take, it, it may be so rich and so satisfying, but, but we only get from one bite. And, and while we're caught nibbling later on the crumbs, the buffet of grace starts to become a little further out of reach. And our impulse to finish what Christ started in us in our own strength, we must, it, it must be exposed. And we must deny our own strength. And you know, we should remember that our Lord and our Savior Jesus, He had to die a horrible death. And he did it because we sinned so horribly. In Galatians, the third chapter, it says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It is before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. I ask you, how can we look at the cross of Christ? How can we look at the cross of Christ and, and those cruel nails and those open wounds? And God himself hanging on a cross, gasping for air. How can we look at that and believe that we could do anything to get or to keep ourselves right with God? You know, if that's what we, if that's what we deserve for our sin, we're more wicked than we can possibly ever imagine. I don't think we can possibly grasp it. And none of us can endure what Jesus endured for you and for me. Not just the physical cross, but the infinite blistering of the volcano of God's righteous anger that was meant for you and that was meant for me. You know, the nature of Jesus' sacrifice rebukes any notion of our works righteousness or our works progress in this world. How could we possibly understand the, the idea of Christ's crucifixion? The scandal of His execution. The weight of the burden that he carried, the gravity of the seriousness of our sins, and the enormity of God's wrath. How could we possibly understand that idea and hold on to any hope of justifying ourselves or sanctifying ourselves? You see, when we do not fail to stand strong in faith and in service, 
but we fail to achieve anything among our fellow men except for their opposition, that's when we should think of our Savior. That's when we should think of our Lord and our Savior Jesus who was persecuted and who was suffering and died for us. This morning, I think that it is very important that we grow in love and praise through suffering at the hands of our enemies. And I think it's very important that we join our Savior in loving and in forgiving. It's not easy. Is it? But you know, Christ, He did it for you, and He did it for me. And I think that it's the least that we can do for him. We're also told in Scripture that the conclusion of the meal, disciples say again, we will conclude as well.